To all the drivers out there delivering holiday cheer across our great country, season's greetings and a huge thank you from the Allen Lund Company. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Scott Thompson. Volunteers of a service that provides meals for truck drivers are gearing up for another busy Christmas season. We speak with one of the original members of Meals for 18 Wheels about the organization and how vital the service has become for those drivers in need. And it's no secret that trucking can be a lonely profession. There are a whole host of mental health issues that often come with the job. And loneliness is at the top of the list. But there are some strategies for dealing with the feelings that sometimes arise. Therapist Buck Black joins the program with some tips. And finally, federal regulators have big plans in 2024 for new trucking rules. We've previewed quite a few of the possible changes. Jay Grimes, OIDA Director of Federal Affairs, joins the program to break down a few others. All of that and more coming up. But first, the news with Ashley Blackford. Thanks, Scott. The acting administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration will soon be leaving. Ann Carlson announced she'll be stepping down from her position on December 26th. She was originally nominated to lead NHTSA, but the nomination was withdrawn in May. Reuters is reporting that NHTSA Deputy Administrator Sophie Schallman will serve as acting administrator. More truck parking is coming to Wyoming. $26.6 million was awarded to the Wyoming Department of Transportation through a federal grant from the U.S. DOT. The money will be used to build approximately 365 truck parking spaces along Interstate 80 in Evanston. Parking area construction is expected to begin in spring of 2026, depending on design time, project letting schedule, and other potential scheduling considerations. The total project cost is approximately 33 $3.3 million. Almost $28 million has been announced for the U.S. 1 road improvement project in northern Maine. The project will reconstruct two sections of U.S. 1 near Frenchville. The project includes reconstruction of the road, easing pavement and cross slope conditions, adjusting vertical curves to match the existing horizontal alignment, full shoulder reconstruction, drainage and retaining wall improvements, and new tie ins. Recently, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg was on New Center, Maine, talking about the investment and why it's important rural areas receive funding. Well, part of why we created the uh, rural program, and this is all part of uh, the the bipartisan infrastructure package, uh, part of the focus uh, of that was to make sure that rural areas don't get left behind. Often the biggest dollars go to the biggest cities. And of course, there are big needs in big cities, but there are big needs in rural America too. And if you're living in that area around Frenchville or any of the other places around the U.S., where we're funding these rural programs, we know that those investments can mean the world to a community's ability to uh, to thrive, uh, whether we're talking about economic well-being or just the basic safety of having the kind of road that you need, including the kinds of improvements that are coming uh, to uh, uh, to US-1. Uh, past rounds of, of infrastructure investment in U.S. history sometimes have only gone gone to areas that uh, that were already doing pretty well. We want to make sure that no area is left behind in any part of the country, and that means communities of all sizes. This funding is part of a $645 million investment by the Biden-Harris administration to help meet rural transportation and mobility needs. The truck driver responsible for the deaths of 16 people in a bus crash in Saskatchewan is another step closer to being deported from Canada. CTV News reports that a federal judge has dismissed Jaskirat Singh Sidhu's bid to avoid deportation. He is currently a permanent resident, but under federal law can be subject to deportation in the instance of a serious criminal offense. In 2019, he was given an eight-year sentence after pleading guilty to dangerous driving, causing death and bodily harm in a crash that killed 16 people and injured 13 others. He had been a truck driver less than a month before the crash with the Humboldt Broncos bus in 2018. Sidhu now has the option of applying for permanent residency on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. 
Millions of dollars worth of hard narcotics were found in a shipment of jalapeno paste recently. U.S. Customs and Border Protection reports that on December 13th, officers encountered a 28-year-old male driving a commercial tractor trailer with a shipment manifested as jalapeno paste. The driver was referred for further examination when he crossed at the Ote Mesa cargo facility in California. A CBP K-9 unit screened the shipment and alerted officers to examine the trailer more closely. Officers discovered a total of 349 suspicious packages in vats of jalapeno paste. The contents of the packages were tested and identified as methamphetamine with a weight of 3,161 pounds and cocaine with a weight of 522 pounds. CBP officers seized the narcotics and commercial tractor trailer while the driver was turned over to Homeland Security Investigations for further processing. The estimated street value of the narcotics is more than $10 million. An effort to prevent wrongway crashes in Utah continues. Utah's Department of Transportation has installed 15 wrongway detection systems around the state so far this year, and eight more are in the works. According to a press release, there have been 18 wrongway driving crashes in 2023, with six fatalities. The new wrongway driver detection and alert system consists of a detector unit, which includes radar and high-definition infrared cameras, and a series of red wrongway warning signs equipped with solar-powered, high-intensity LED lights. A plan to build a new bridge that will connect Oregon and Washington is one step closer. Oregon Live reports that the Interstate 5 bridge replacement was awarded a $600 million grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation recently. The total cost of the bridge is expected to ring in at about $7.5 billion. Members of the bridge planning team plan to seek $2.5 billion in federal grants. Oregon and Washington are expected to contribute $1 billion each, and the rest is expected to come from tolling revenue. No word yet on when construction will begin to replace the current 100-year-old bridge. An ELD that was previously revoked by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has been reinstated. Power Trucks ELD is now back on the list of registered electronic logging devices. On December 1st, Power Trucks ELD was one of 10 that was removed from the list. According to FMCSA, the devices were revoked because they failed to meet the minimum requirements. The regulation requires that a device without a printer be designed so that the display may be reasonably viewed by an authorized safety official without the official entering the vehicle. According to FMCSA, revoked devices can be returned to the approved list if the ELD manufacturer corrects all identified deficiencies. Loves has announced four new locations. The newly opened Loves travel stops are in Michigan City, Indiana, Nicholas, Mississippi, and Watertown, New York. A fourth location in California is scheduled to open in the coming days. The stores have a combined 377 truck parking spaces, 93 of those in California, 114 in Indiana, 99 in Mississippi, and 71 in New York. An information session to discuss oversize and overweight loads in Canada's province of British Columbia is set to happen this week. On December 20th, B.C.'s Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure's Commercial Vehicle Safety and Enforcement Branch will be hosting a virtual information session for industry stakeholders. The two-hour session will take place from 9 to 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Topics will be covered according to the province include routing, permitting, and other matters to support education across the industry to promote compliance and minimize the potential for overpass strikes. And finally, an Armenian teenager was awarded the Guinness World Record for the most consecutive pull-ups on a bar positioned between two moving semi-trucks. UPI reports that the 18-year-old was able to do 44 pull-ups. The trucks were required to maintain a speed of at least 3.1 miles per hour during the attempt. The previous record was 35 pull-ups set in 2022. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Ashley Blackford. Thanks, Ashley. Coming up next, an organization that does great work all year round is gearing up for a busy holiday week, and you can help. Ashley's back with that story on Meals for 18 Wheels after the break. Landline Now returns right after this. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. 
control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with Prepass Tolls. Prepass Tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Attention all truckers, Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it, they're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline now. Welcome back. Meals for 18 Wheels is a temporary service for truck drivers who are in need of a meal. To speak about that, Crystal Lips joins me. Crystal, can you start out by explaining how you got involved with this effort? the original workforce behind Mills for 18 Wheels. Okay. For the first year that it was in operation, I did everything myself. Oh, wow. So I did all that, and I was on the page for quite some time, and then I had some um, some family medical issues coming up where I had to go down to Florida and care for my mother-in-law at the time that passed away. And so, um, so I stepped away from the page for a little while, and um, and then so I... I reached out to the amends that are still on there, which has been on there since I stepped away. So I was like, hey, y'all need some help. I'll just come back, you know, and help you guys out. And they're like, oh, great, great, great. Oh, you nice. know, so that's my um, history with the pages. I, okay. The first Thanksgiving, the first Christmas, I think I believe it was 2012. It was just me. Okay. Wow. So you started the page. The, the page um, came from an idea from a friend of mine. Her name is Diana Sterling. And so it was started and I just kind of just took it over because I was at the time I was a truck driver's wife and I wasn't doing anything except for riding shotgun in a semi. And I was like, okay, I ain't got no more time. <laughs> and what, I guess I'm curious, where did the idea, where did it come from? And talk to me about the, and I guess what it is for our listeners who don't know what Meals for 18 Wheels is. Um, well, like I said, the idea came from um, Diana and she was a truck driver herself and she was just wanting to help drivers get a holiday meal the best she could and so whenever the page got started I kind of said well hey I you know like I said I don't have anything but time let me go ahead and, and we'll do this and so I was literally pairing up volunteers with drivers that first Thanksgiving with two notebooks and a phone wow. <laughs> so basically the idea behind it is for holiday meals Thanksgiving and Christmas um, normally it's for two days, the the day before and the holiday itself, um, where the drivers, you know, cause most of them are, you know, sitting somewhere, nobody's open. Mm. So, um, so if they're sitting somewhere, they can, you know, say, Hey, this is where I'm at. And we actually, um, we have a, a button on our page for the volunteers to join. And so, and the, only the amends on that page can see that the the um any but anybody else from the outside can't see the information provided. Mm-hmm. And so what that does is that gives us a spreadsheet to where we can just go through and say, okay, you know, driver is in Salt Lake City, so say. And so then we got our volunteer that's in, you know twenty minutes away, but they're willing to go over to Salt Lake City. So we we just reach out and we pair them up like that. Um, mm-hmm. Same thing with Christmas, but this is a greater need. It's, it's, um, there's drivers that go through this year round, Mm -hmm. you know, especially new drivers, but also veteran drivers. Sometimes they get stuck at a shipper or a receiver. Sometimes they're stuck, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, I've been there sometimes, most times in Arizona, there's not a lot of stuff, you know, you just kind of get stuck. So, um, so we decided to go ahead and start offering that service year round. So if somebody finds themselves, Stuck at a shipper receiver overnight, you can't leave because you know your electronic logs tell you you can't leave. And um, there's a lot of places that will deliver, but they won't deliver to a shipper or receiver to your truck simply because you're in a truck. Mm. So we we um, extended that year round to where if they if somebody finds themselves in you know a situation, 
we can try and locate them a volunteer. That that especially goes for rookies. You know, there's a lot of companies and, um, you know, we, we know they get stuck. We know that they're just starting out. And so sometimes, you know, they're just working to pay the bills at home, you know, mm-hmm. and we understand that. So we try to help, you know, in situations like that too all year round. But our main focus is Christmas and Thanksgiving for the ones that are, you know, out there working and everything's shut down, you know, and they, there's nowhere to go. So when it started back in 2012, it was just you with a phone and a notebook. It's now a Facebook page. Is that right? Yeah. Well, it was a Facebook page to start out with. Okay. And um, Carrie Fisher, she is the one that started um, Missing Truck Driver Alert Network. Mm-hmm. And um, her and Diana were friends. I was friends. Um, so Diana had the idea. Carrie started the page. And then it was handed over to me. So the the day that the page was started... It was handed over to me to run, and everything else was left up to me. It was my responsibility. Mm-hmm. So, but that's that's the that's the backstory of it. And like I said, there's many different versions. Okay. But um, from day one, it was mm-hmm. in my hands. And you've started to operate year round. Do you find it's busier around Thanksgiving and Christmas, though? It is. It is. Um, ma- like I said, mainly because I come from a family of truck drivers, my dad and my uncle, my brothers, my aunts. And so um, so I kind of know the feeling. Plus, I was married to a truck driver, you know, where you're just stuck. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot, a lot of places open. And if it is, if you're stuck at a, you know, a ship or a receiver, you can't go nowhere. And so um, they are a little bit busier, but I will say throughout the whole year, it's busy as well because drivers find themselves in situations that they didn't anticipate, Mm -hmm. you know, being broke down, being stuck again. So, And of course, I mean, the lack of truck parking. Yeah. (laughs) You you, you don't often see restaurants with truck parking, so. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and and sadly, you know, there's a lot of um, businesses that don't, you know, if your parking lot might be big enough, but they still don't want you there. Mm, yeah. You know, even if you're just stopping in for a meal, like, hey, I'm just here for 30 minutes to eat. Mm. They still don't care. Yeah. Or have you ever been surprised by the um, the support of the people who come forward and, and offer a meal? Oh, goodness, yes. Um, there, There's quite a few people that, like, go above and they're beyond. Like, they will literally set up, you know, their whole car, you know, you know, their trunk and they'll bring like everything, you know, and, and they're not sitting at home at their table. They're at the truck stop, you know, in the, in the parking lot and saying, you know, I have a whole holiday meal right here in my car for, for 20 people, you Mm -hmm. know, and there's also, you know, volunteers that, that will go and hand out, you know, Christmas cookies. And some of them hand out um, stockings with essentials, you know, like toothbrush and toothpaste, some deodorant, maybe some pens and paper, things that truckers use every single day. And it's just a stocking full of stuff. How important is that, do you think? Like you said, you have a lot of family members um, that have been truck drivers. How important is that for, you know, those truck drivers to get that support in times of need? I think it's very important. Um, mainly because, you know, drivers are out there. Some of them, you know, some, some of them have their animals with them. Some of them do have their spouses with them. Some of them on the summers, you know, like with me, I rode in the truck with my dad. But whenever somebody doesn't have the opportunity to have, you know, a, a warm body or, you know, the, whether it's human or animal, you, you get you get depressed, you know, and mm-hmm. so you're, and you're lonely and you're bored. And just to know that somebody that you, that you don't know is willing to help you, you know, because you're, you know, you're out there working you, to bring them stuff. And so somebody that you don't know is willing to bring you Christmas dinner. I think it's very important because it kind of, for me, it restores my faith and, and humanity a little bit. Like, you know, that, you're willing to take time out of your holiday for just a few minutes to take somebody a meal that, you know, that they wouldn't otherwise be getting because they're not at home. They're out there working. Do you have any stories from the past of, of posts and connections that have been made that stand out? Um, for me personally, my 
second year of doing the page, um, I was actually home based in Chattanooga. So I was able to, and our, our closest truck stop in Chattanooga was probably about 30 minutes away. And, um, my kids are grown, so it was just me and my husband at the time who was a truck driver. So I just decided, hey, I'm going to make, I'm going to just make a bunch of food, and we're going to go to the truck stop. You know, I was like, <laughs> I don't have any use for all this food, but I, I don't, I come from a big family, so I don't know how to cook small. <laughs> so I was just like, let's go, let's take yep. it, and so we went and took it. <laughs> you know, mm. and. Um, there's a little, um, like kind of warning on the page. We, we encourage them to meet inside the building, wherever you're meeting. And of course, everybody has their own, you know, preferences and whatever, and and we can't tell you not to do it. But that day I was just like, you know, I pretty much, these are my people, Mm -hmm. you know? So I was like, I'm going to walk around and I'm going to knock on doors. And that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. And there was one gentleman, he was so ecstatic. He was just, you know, I, I didn't knock on anybody's doors that the sleeper was, you know, close. And so he was just sitting there. I was like, would you like a Christmas dinner? And he goes, what? And he was so shocked. And he was like, oh, my goodness, are you kidding? And he started crying. And, and so I started crying. I was like, he's like, what do I owe you? I said, nothing, absolutely nothing, you know. And I was just telling him that, you know, there's a Facebook page that called Meals for 18 Wheels, and this is what we do. I said, I happen to be homebound this year, so I'm just handing out, you know, Christmas dinner. And he was so ecstatic that he wow. that he had it because he wasn't sure when he was even going to be leaving the truck stop. So I was like, well, here you go. Oh, so, wow. And, awesome. and that's not just something that, that I did homebound um, whenever I was on the, the road with my husband at the time. I would cook in the truck, and um, I would post on my personal Facebook page, hey, I'm in Albuquerque. Is anybody here that wants some home-cooked food? Because I have plenty. Mm -hmm. You know, and so for me, it was a daily thing because I was cooking in the truck. And talk to me about that. That I mean, home-cooked food is something that a lot of drivers don't experience for weeks or months on end when they're out on the road. There's quite a few informational things on there that that shows you know that tells drivers how you can cook mm-hmm. in your truck you know i know that the truck stops you know they have those little hot boxes and stuff but you can actually cook in the truck with you know an electric skillet and a hot plate you know and and you can still have the same food that you would have at home in the truck mm-hmm. i mean you cook it the same yep it's just on a different a different instrument. Um, have you noticed the need grow over the years with just how the economy's going and how prices are getting higher and higher? And like you said, you know, a lot of these guys, if they're new, they're just kind of inexperienced as far as planning ahead um, to no fault of their own. I'm sure it's just something that you kind of need to learn as you go. But have you noticed that? Oh, absolutely. It, I mean, it's, especially with the new drivers, you know, that's a big thing. And um, it, one of the things that I like to stress to new drivers is, you know, kind of like an emergency kit, you know, you, you got to have some canned goods, you got to have some water, you got to, you got to have this stuff, especially during winter, because you don't know what's going to happen, especially, you know, it, especially during the blizzards, and you get in a pile up, you could be on the side of the road with nothing for four or five days until the tow truck starts showing mm-hmm. up. So yeah. um, it's very important to have backup inside your truck, you know, to, to get you through a couple of days. And I know, you know, starting out being a new driver, sometimes that's difficult. And that's where we try to pick up the slack, you know, the pieces on that. But it's very important to be prepared for, you know, the inevitable because you you just don't know out there on the road, you know, what's going to happen. So, I mean, it, it's all about preparation, really. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Crystal. For more information or to volunteer, you can visit Meals for 18 Wheels on Facebook. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Stay tuned for more after this. 
Today's rising costs affect everyone. Replace your harmonic damper with a genuine Vibratech TVD viscous damper to prevent costly repairs and downtime. Keep your money in your pocket and your truck on the road with Vibratech TVD. Recommended replacement at 500,000 miles or 15,000 hours. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. Landline now, welcome back. Licensed therapist Buck Black joins me now. Buck, you've had truck drivers as clients. I'm curious, what are some of the common issues they often deal with? Well, there would be a handful of issues. Loneliness is definitely one of them. If you think about just the fact that the job typically is that you're bouncing around in the truck all day long, 24 hours a day, you're you're in that truck for days on end, if not weeks on end. So loneliness is a big one. And then plenty of times that leads into depression. And so as far as, you know, feeling really down, lack of energy, being really negative, so, so that is really common. And then stress and anxiety often goes right along with depression. So as far as, you know, all these worries, just feeling really anxious about all kinds of things. And then plenty of times that leads into relationship problems. So it can definitely all be related there. And then the more relationship problems that you have either lack of relationship completely or the fact that you have relationships, but yet you're not home enough and then there's arguing or just uh, feeling distant or unsatisfied. So it can, it can turn into a, a really complicated situation really quickly. It sounds like each one is kind of like a domino effect. If, if you don't deal with, with one of those things, it can kind of have that domino effect. Is that right? Right. I think that most people are really trained of, of being able to spot, all right, this is depression, this is anxiety. I think our, our society is, is very good in pointing those things out. And the reality of it is it's all connected. And it goes back to what you said with the domino effect. And then before you know it, life is really tough. And, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a lot of misery or maybe it's to the point that you can no longer be on the road just because of everything that's, that's going on and how you're feeling. When it comes to loneliness, what do you often hear from drivers about this? Well, uh, sometimes it's drivers being surprised because it's the, oh, I want to be a truck driver so I can see the country and the call of the open road and, you know, all of that great stuff. And then they're surprised of how isolating it is, how quiet it is, how... You see a lot of interstates, and uh, for the most part, the interstate always looks the same, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that drivers are not trained so much to realize that if you're an over-the-road truck driver, you're always in a long-distance relationship. So even, you know, whatever, even if you're married, even if you've had a had a partner for quite some time, now all of a sudden you're in a long-distance relationship and then nobody ever really understands how tough long-distance relationships are. So there, there's a lot that, uh, well, there's a lot that comes with the job that uh, that's unexpected. And what tips do you have for drivers who are feeling lonely? You know, when you mentioned depression and anxiety, I think people know, well, there's medication for that, but... Is there, I don't think there's medication for loneliness. You know, what, what advice do you have for that? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, a, a good point that there are no meds for loneliness. If it is a domino effect and you're feeling really anxious, really depressed, then sometimes medication is appropriate to help to, to deal with that domino effect. But since I'm a therapist, I really push do as many natural things as possible um, as far as changing your thinking, changing your behavior, eating as healthily as possible, of trying to stay away from the junk, trying to stay away from the fast food. So, I mean, that's, that's a little bit of it. A big part is accepting the feelings because a lot of drivers will not want to accept the fact that I am 
lonely, especially, you know, if, if it's a guy that uh, is like really macho, well, I can't be lonely. That's not very macho. Well, we all have those feelings. Mm. So acceptance of the feelings, that's definitely a big part of it. Finding time to be grateful. So, you know, okay, this is really tough. This is lonely. I'm down. But what do I have going in my favor? What can I be grateful for? That's a, a big thing that uh, that drivers often forget. Also, having something to look forward to. So as far as your home time, all right, you know, you have that on your calendar. How much longer do I have to be out before I can come home? And a lot of drivers really push it, and they don't have very much home time at all, and they could they could have more. So I recognize you're not making money if you're at home, but if you can do some extra home time, then that's definitely something that, that can help. Mm-hmm. What about for the spouse or family member that's not on the road that is at home? What advice do you have for them? Well, I think that it's about trying to connect. And something that I say, like uh, pretty much in in every interview and, and to every client, is don't rely on texting. And the sad part of it is that's not getting any better. It's probably getting worse. So if you look at all right, if if I'm trying to connect with my partner, I'm the one at home and I'm texting. All right, well, there are positives to that. But the more phone calls that you can do, and then if you can uh, safely do a video conference, um, obviously not while driving, a video chat is something that can help and bring the two of you closer together. I think that that's a big one. Mm-hmm. And then for the partner at home, you know, it's also what can you focus on that is instead of I'm lonely, it's all right. Are there other people I can connect with? Can I get out and, uh, you know, join some kind of club, volunteer, do something that uh, that keeps you active? And that's something that can really help. And I want to, I want to also add uh, for the driver, I am a fan of uh, Trucker Buddy. So uh, truckerbuddy.org being that a driver essentially is a pen pal with a uh, a, a school uh, classroom, so a group of students. And that's a, that's a different way to have a little bit of interaction and be a positive role model to kids. And uh, you know what? It helps the kids and it also helps the driver. Mm-hmm. So getting involved one way or another is, is something that often helps. When you talk to truck drivers and, and they are struggling with their mental health, do they oftentimes pinpoint that it's loneliness or does that sometimes, do they have different feelings and they don't really realize, you know, that it is just because they are lonely? Well, usually I don't have anyone call me and say, I'm lonely, uh, I need help. Mm. It is more of, I'm angry and I need help. I'm really stressed out, I need help. And then again, the I have whatever type of relationship problem. That's usually how it comes about. And plenty of times, mm, for men, just in general, not Every every guy is this way at all, but the loneliness is more of an irritability, anger kind of thing. And if you're looking at women in general, they're more likely to say I'm lonely or or to say eh, I'm I'm feeling down. I'm I'm having not a good mood. So yeah, it's important to to pay attention to all the feelings that you're feeling, and then trying to figure out okay, well, what is this about? What can I what can I trace this back to? And when I get home, do I still feel this way or does that go, is that reduced or does that go away? So, yeah, there's a good bit to it. There's underlying, underlying feelings here. What would you say to someone who may be listening and wondering if they do need to reach out for help? Well, help is definitely available. The good news is that teletherapy has become so popular over the past few years, as I think most people realize. So there is the politics of needing to talk with a therapist that's licensed in the state that you live. So if you do an online search for teletherapists and then you for the state that you live in, that's a really good path to go down. And then it doesn't necessarily have to be professional. It doesn't necessarily have you don't necessarily have to spend money. So any kind of uh, support group that you can find, there's a million 
Facebook uh, support groups. That kind of thing is good. And then the old-fashioned reaching out to friends, family, uh, old classmates, and, uh, you know, you, you just keep reaching out, keep reaching out, and you'll never know who you, find, who, who you might find that would be helpful. So there's plenty of different ways to connect with other people and to get help. And you kind of touched on this earlier, but what are some of the signs or, or questions even someone should ask themselves if they, they think they might need help but they're not really sure? Well, I, it goes back to functioning. So that, that would be what I would say is the number one thing. So if you feel that you're not functioning very well, and what I mean by that is if you can't really get through your workday so well, that's something to pay attention to. That's an indicator. If someone is any of the above as far as anxious, depressed, really lonely, all that stuff, typically you're not going to sleep very well. So if you find yourself having a really hard time going to sleep or having a hard time waking up or difficulty staying asleep, so anything sleep-related, that is often an indicator that they need to work on things. Appetite is another one. So either you're not eating or you're eating way too much. That would be another one. So it can get more complicated than that, but those are the typical questions that I ask any new client just to get an idea of how are they doing with their, with their mood, how, how are they feeling overall. And if you're struggling in that area and it's going on for a few weeks, it's good to uh, reach out to someone. So, yeah. Why is it so important to reach out and get help? Because mental health is still incredibly ignored. It has gotten better over the past few years. So I, I do want to, to give credit to the fact that we are in better shape as far as awareness of mental health. But typically, before somebody gets help for mental health, whether it's therapy, a support group, or going to the doctor for meds, uh, the person has had this issue for years. It depends on what studies you look at. The, the number that comes up commonly is seven years of going through these feelings of depression, anxiety, all of this, uh, before a person gets help. So what I try to do as a therapist is help people to speed that up. So mm. don't suffer for seven years. You know, if you have these feelings going on for several weeks, then talk to somebody and uh, see, see what's going on. I'd much rather a person reach out uh, a little uh, prematurely or it end up being nothing and uh, go that route versus waiting for years on it. When you do get a new client in there, do you have, do you often find sometimes they're hesitant on, is this really going to work? Sure. And I think that makes sense. And if you look at just everything in the world that is, you know, that there's so many scams, there's so much snake oil, so many promises of things that are not realistic. It's good to be skeptical. And what I find myself telling clients on a very regular basis is, okay, well, just Google what I say. So I'll give some tips. And the more the person is skeptical, you know, do your own research and look at, look at credible websites when you Google, obviously. But, you know, it's like as simple as if you get some exercise every day and you try to eat as many fruits and vegetables as you can and try to back off on the fast food, there's science that shows that that already helps with mood. And, and there's science that shows that, uh, you know, if you just call up an old friend and talk with them for a few minutes, that, that helps with the loneliness, that helps with mood. So for the skeptical people, I would say, number one, do your research. There's a lot of information on mental health out there all the way around. And number two, give it a try and maybe, maybe get a self-help book. Start with that. See the techniques. And then you'll find something that works for you. If you feel that you need more, talk with a therapist, talk with your doctor. They'll suggest more things. Give it a try because uh, it, 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 definitely, it definitely does help. That was Buck Black, a licensed therapist, talking about mental health and the importance of seeking help. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Stay tuned for more after this. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. 
At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Welcome back. We've hit the home stretch of our show today, and as we hit the home stretch of 2023, We've been doing quite a bit of looking ahead to 2024 to see what's in store. And when it comes to possible rulemakings, there's a lot to parse through. We've told you about the timelines on several issues. Now we're going to look at a few more with the help of Jay Grimes. Jay is OIDA's Director of Federal Affairs, and he joins us here in Studio A now. Jay, always good to see you. Good to be back. We should start by noting here that all this information is courtesy of the Fall 2023 Regulatory Agenda which was recently released by the USDOT. We've talked about it a little bit. We're going to get into some of these other rulemakings that are kind of lurking out there. Let's start with a call from FMCSA for additional training requirements, not driver training per se, but training related to sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, kind of looks like the agency is working toward an advance notice of proposed rulemaking here, Jay. Yeah, that's correct. And certainly driver training is a critical issue. We are happy to see the minimum entry-level driver training standards rulemaking uh, finally go into effect uh, last year. Um, certainly, there's some aspects that, that we'd like to see uh, improved. And, uh, you know, looking at uh, one part of that, the uh, agency has announced that they're going to be undertaking an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, could be out in July of next year, and this is going to be looking at ways that FMCSA can enhance the physical safety of women truck drivers and trainees and address the negative impacts of workplace sexual harassment. Also going to be looking at uh, ways in which FMCSA can enhance the safety of vulnerable road users, including pedestrians and bicyclists. So some focused areas uh, that they're going to be uh, examining, certainly on the heels of the Women of Trucking Advisory Board that's been meeting for about the last year and in the process of, of submitting a, a report to FMCSA. I'm sure some of their recommendations are going to be reflected uh, when this uh, notice comes out next year. But also maybe a chance to, to more broadly improve the, the entry-level driver training standards rulemaking as well. I know FMCSA is always curious on, on, on what ways that they can uh, enhance that rulemaking because really... When you look at it, uh, a better trained driver is going to uh, result in a safer driver. And, and now that we've had the rulemaking in place uh, you know, for a little more than a year and a half, can I think look back and examine some of the, the trends that FMCSA has kind of uh, been aware of since the, the rulemaking was implemented. Yeah, it's interesting to see how this process works. And I think you hit the nail on the head there probably with the Women of Trucking Advisory Board. Uh, a lot of the recommendations that they have put forward are now being listened to by FMCSA, and I'm sure we're going to see some of these in the training procedures moving forward. Um, as I said, this one that we just talked about doesn't necessarily apply to driver training, uh, driver training, I should emphasize driver training per se. This next one does, though, uh, also from FMCSA, it's called the New Entrance Safety Assurance Process. What is the idea here? Yeah, so earlier this year in the spring version of the regulatory agenda, we saw FMCSA kind of reopen this new entrant safety assurance process. And this was something uh, they looked at uh, about 10 years ago to ways to ensure a, a new motor carrier is knowledgeable about the federal motor carrier safety regulations and kind of have the proficiency that once they start driving that uh, they're going to be safe out, out on the roads. And and. Back in 2009, FMCSA had opened an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, took some public comments from a petition raised from the Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety regarding new entrant applicant knowledge. The agency kind of shelved that, but now back on the priority list and uh, projected date here again for a, another advance notice of proposed rulemaking July of next year. And I think this is really a result of the uh, growth of uh, new motor carrier registrations that FMCSA and, and DOT have have uh, witnessed over the last uh, couple of years, or a real rise in these new new carriers, and uh, want to make sure that they're entering uh, the industry safely. So, going to be taking a look at potential ways to do that. I think back in 2009, it was an idea of an actual uh, examination test. And I think there were some questions and uncertainties if that would be the best way. So I think um, still 
too early to tell exactly what FMCSA specifically is going to try uh, and put into place here for, for, for new entrants. But kind of, I think this is another way to, to supplement and assure safety, especially for those drivers just starting out. Yeah, I think a, a more well-rounded training process is something that OIDA would certainly support. Yep. Moving toward things that OIDA would not nece- would not necessarily support yeah. here. We've been watching the EPA forge ahead with these strict new emission rules for heavy trucks, and we've got a big one, a final rule, no less, slated for March, just around the corner. That's right, and and this is the latest in a kind of a series of, uh, of regulations that EPA has proposed, and this latest one is known as Phase Three beginning uh, model year 2028, although there's a little bit of a proposed reopening for model year 2027, really cracking down on overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there, there's one rule uh, for commercial vehicles. There's a separate rule for, for all other vehicles on the road. So this is not a, a specific truck-targeted regulation, but some of the things they want to do here, especially as it relates to, to manufacturing of uh, uh, electric vehicles and zero-emission vehicles, this proposal had uh, specific targets that manufacturers would have to meet. And really did not address a lot of the concerns that uh, the trucking industry has uh, about the reliability, about the performance uh, of electric vehicles uh, right now. And, and the timelines that they present, I, I think, are overly optimistic uh, in, in achieving uh, some of those manufacturing uh, targets. Um, and kind of historically, uh, when you have these EPA uh, emissions rulemakings, they're too tight of a window, and that results in the new vehicles being manufactured that they're going to be higher cost and they're not going to be as reliable as they should be. That, in turn, uh, really forces the hand of a, of a lot of truckers to kind of hang on to their older vehicle uh, for longer than they'd like, uh, just given uh, you know they can't afford some of the, the new vehicles with all the emissions technologies. This is kind of a, the latest example of that. Uh, we were certainly uh, adamantly opposed to, to some of the electric vehicle requirements uh, in the proposal. But as you mentioned, uh, EPA certainly uh, seems to, to be pushing forward uh, as soon as possible, and we're going to kind of see what parts of the proposal are included uh, in the final rule as soon as uh, March of next year. We'll keep an eye on that. One thing I wanted to touch on here, Jay, and I don't think we've probably paid enough attention to it uh, in recent months, is this automated driving systems proposal that FMCSA is pushing forward here with. Uh, We've got a notice of proposed rulemaking sent, or I guess being sent, or will be sent to the Office of Management and Budget in 2024. Walk us through what we're looking for here. Right. So, kind of the automated vehicles that have really uh, developed and escalated over the last few years. All the agencies within DOT kind of uh, did some uh, internal background work to to see if there were parts of their jurisdiction that needed to be amended to kind of account for the development and introduction of automated vehicles and automated driving systems technology. FMCSA has put out a couple of advanced notices trying to gather informations, uh, information on what aspects of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations would need to be changed or modified to let these vehicles operate uh, in interstate commerce. Um, the stuff they put out there is mostly hypothetical. We really don't oh, have that's enough. That's great. Yeah, don't have <laughs> that enough. That sounds inf- fun. Yeah, and that's kind of the the, the problem uh, with these self driving trucks and and some of the the technology that's being tested. We really don't know how it's going to be adopted wide term for the entire trucking industry. But sounds like FMCSA has put together some sort of proposal uh, that is going to be re- reviewed at the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, that process usually takes four, eight, 12 weeks, you never really know. It does seem like we're going to see a notice of proposed rulemaking um, sometime next year. How specific it is, what it contains, uh, kind of remains to be seen. Four, eight, 12 months, we should know, right there. Uh, so you you never know. It could be as soon as uh, <laughs> weeks. Could be, oh, Sometimes okay. it could, does go longer. <laughs> it's kind of a guessing game, but they do have a proposal uh, that's being reviewed right now. Lots to sift through, Jay. We appreciate you doing that, first of all. And secondly, we always appreciate you coming by and sharing all the details with us. Thank you. Our thanks to Jay Grimes of OYD's Washington, D.C. office, and our thanks to you for listening. That's our show for today, but we're back tomorrow with another. Until next time, take care. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. 
Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad, a son, a husband, wife, I'm a writer, photographer, I farm, I'm a veteran. I love old cars, fishing, my kids, chrome, and I am, I am, I am a professional truck driver. And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com. Oh, oh,